So um, a quick word about systems, how systems operate. Syst when we say um, there's nothing we can do, it's the system. We are reinforcing something that came up in the lecture last night, which uh, coincidentally or not is the first slide of this lecture which is the, the war crimes trial of Adolf Eichmann in the 60s. He was a Nazi. He was instrumental in the establishment of the concentration camps. And he said, listen, I was just, I'm not an important person. It's not about me. I'm a nice guy. He was, you know, he, he's a nice guy, right? He has children. He's got a good marriage. He's fun to play golf with. I'm making this up. Um, but he's making the argument, I was just doing what I was told. I was just being a good architect. Well, he wasn't an architect, but it's equivalent to being uh, an architect who simply does what the client asks them to do without questioning it. Uh, Frederick Engels could have, at the age of 24, like not much older than you guys, Three or four years older than you guys, right? You got how old are you guys? Hmm? Twenty-one. Twenty-one. Okay. So, uh, someone around your age, his father said, "Son, it's time you learn the business. I think you should come down to Manchester and run the floor of my factory." And so he did. And uh, in an Adolf Eichmann approach, would have been, oh. I guess this is the system when he sees the flashy, the glittering storefronts as he goes through Manchester and then he glimpses down the alleys and he sees puddles and he smells things that are disturbing. Uh, the Eichmann thing to do is to turn his head so he doesn't see it. The anti-Eichmann thing to do is to walk down the alleys step through the puddles, smell the stench, and then write a book about it at the age of 24. That is so un Eichmann of him. Um, so the two guys are opposites. If he had been Eichmann, we never would have heard of Frederick Engels, and there may have been no Marxism, because Engels and Karl Marx co-authored the Communist Manifesto. There may have been no communism. So at what point is the architecture and urban form so unacceptable, so disturbing, that someone who was brought up in a wealthy family of factory owners is disturbed enough to write about it, and the writing is disturbing enough to trigger a global revolution that transformed the world in the 20th century? Wow, that's effective writing. That's a good way to be the anti Eichmann, right? So the thing about that Hannah Arendt pointed out about evil is its banality. It's banal. It's natural. It just happens in the background when people don't make waves, when they just accept it. Okay? And the key to design thinking that we referred to in the Anthropocene lecture is empathy. So the radical revolutionary thing that Friedrich Engels, uh, that triggered this revolution, was empathy for the workers. He dared, in a radical revolutionary move, he dared to have empathy for the workers in his father's factory. Empathy, by the way, is the first and most important uh, step in design thinking, and when you get to professional practice, it is uh, at the core of the professional ethics, ethical obligations of the architect. So what do cities do in relation to the operations and reproduction of the systems of international capitalism? And what is, by the way, what is capitalism? Very quickly, in high school, when you took economics, who took economics? You remember the four things? Very quickly, land, labor, capital, and profit. They might have said entrepreneurs, 
or entrepreneurship, but that really bothers me. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to say profit, the profit motive. It's not about the personality of the people. We know that because of Adolf Eichmann. It's not about the personality of the people. It's about the choices that people make under the influence of certain forces, like the desire for profit. The, and uh, maybe, maybe one of you here is Jesus in you know, reborn, but I'm guessing probably not. Sorry, no offense, right? I hope you, this doesn't hurt anyone's feelings. Um, I think, I've known a lot of evil people in my lifetime. One of my best friends in high school, his father was uh, the owner of several mines. And uh, I knew at the time, even in high school, that mines were sources of extreme harm, death, and, uh, and destruction of the planet. Uh, but I knew this owner of the mines, these copper mines in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and he was a lovely man. I, he, was, he was like a second father to me. He was a lovely person. So it disrupted my ability to demonize the, uh, the lords of capital, the, the masters of the universe that are directing uh, the destruction of the planet that are causing profound harm and death and um, lives of despair. Uh, nice guy. Making bad choices. So I like to de-emphasize the person and look at the operations of the system. And ultimately, when we say land, what we mean is land and everything that land provides. Food, minerals, everything. All natural resources. And ultimately, the impact of, those, of that extraction on the earth. So I'm connecting it with these final terms. I'm connecting it back to the Anthropocene lecture. So the four, another way of looking at this, the four elements of capitalism are the earth itself, all earthlings, which is not just people, but also the animals, because during your lifetime, the next big social revolution is the species resolution, revolution. Cities, ultimately the tools of capitalism, the tools of production are really embodied in our cities, and they are the cities themselves. And then the desire that drives us to make the choices we make. And it opens up the question, can the desire for a viable planet for our children's children become something that drives um, a healthier capitalism? So because you had this, I'm doing, I'm, I'm skimming over the top of the topic we studied in that first lecture last summer that the Spaniards uh, were the champions of using royal power of the king to deploy ships to extract the land wealth, the resources, from the Americas and elsewhere. And this is the mountain of silver that they discovered in Bolivia, what is now Bolivia in the Andes Mountains that uh, created the Spanish doubloon, which for several centuries was the international currency everywhere in the world. So a mountain of silver. And what do you notice about this image? It's got human scale, architectural scale, human experience in the foreground. It is too opaque. <laughs> thank you. And it's not a real photo, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, it's got the pattern of urban formation in the background, the laws of the Indies grid, and whew, and the, uh, the larger system uh, in the background. Is that, is that right? 
So before the Spanish, this was the world of trade. You remember this? That basically Muslim traders dominated the trade uh, between the Far East and Europe. And the, what was the biggest deal? Probably says. Oh, yeah, it says. So spices were the hot commodity. Uh, it was so, so profitable to sell spices in Europe uh, that that was the big deal. That was the biggest deal in the world were spices. They came from four small islands, um, Ternat, Tidor, in, in current day Indonesia, the Spice Islands, and they're too small to even show up on the map. And no one, even, even here, there was no one in the ports at Goa who knew where these were. They would change hands multiple times. They would go from the islands to a market here, and then the traders would bring them from there to a market on the north coast of Java. And then there would be traders that bring it to Malacca, and then from Malacca to maybe uh, to Sri Lanka, maybe to Goa, maybe to Gujarat, Aden. Uh, it would make it to Constantinople or Cairo, and then end up in Venice. Why is Venice uh, something we study in architectural history? It's because the wealth built the Renaissance. So if you want to study the Renaissance of architectural history, this is the capitalism mechanism that drove the European, the Italian Renaissance. Genoa it's, and Venice, it's no coincidence that Italy is where the Renaissance happened, right? So the Portuguese, for hundreds of years, the Europeans said, got to find the source of those spices, got to find the source of those spices. They were willing to do anything. Um, but for hundreds of years, the Muslim traders uh, kept the secrets. And they also had a code of ethics that, uh, that made it impossible for the system to be overly exploitive. So there were the mechanisms of trust which were produced by the ethical systems of Islam. That's the only way that this worked. And so, was it economics? Yes. Was it the system of economics on its own? No. It was the system of trade that we like to look at the like mechanism of it, but we're kind of blind to the cultural component of that. The ethics of Islamic trade were the crucial prerequisite for any of this. You had to have an ethical system of trust. Without the system of trust and verification, none of this is possible. No spices in Europe, no Renaissance, no European civilization. Then the Portuguese, once, uh, once the Muslims were driven out of the Iberian Peninsula, uh, around the 15th century, Portugal, Henry the Navigator, took all of these scientific developments from China, from Islam, uh, and elsewhere, and developed navigational tools, the compass, the square sail, uh, certain ship hull designs, and maps, 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 that allowed uh, them to sail across and discover, quote unquote, the Indian Ocean, arrive at Goa, and the big mission of the Portuguese and the Spanish was the spread of Catholicism, the spread of Christianity. Save those souls and also spices. And uh, yeah, souls and spices. And so Christopher Columbus, uh, hired by the Spanish, was sent across to find a shortcut to the Spice Islands. So here's Java, and he's looking for the Spice Islands. So the yellow is the map as Christopher Con Columbus conceived it. That very, after a few days sail, they would arrive in the Spice Islands. Um, didn't work out, famously so. And um, the Portuguese and the Spanish were competing for the same 
commerce to colonize the world, and they were both under the power of the Pope. And so they had to go to the Pope to uh, arrange for a settlement. And so the Pope said, listen, here's a line. Everything on this side is Portugal. Everything on this side is Spain. <coughs> OK? But wait, the world is round. OK. So let's extend that line around the world. Everything, this is Portugal from here to here. And this is Spain from here to here. That's why uh, the Spanish, they, they weren't really good at drawing lines. That's why the Portuguese uh, colonized uh, these islands and the Spanish colonized these islands in the Philippines. That's why in Brazil they speak Portuguese. And the rest of South America speaks Spanish. Yeah. So isn't that funny how the Pope split the world in two? Crazy. Who are these crazy Europeans? And what are they even thinking? So the Spanish arrive in Mexico. They find the largest city anyone has ever seen, larger than anything in Europe, more advanced than anything in Europe. And so what do they do? They kill everyone they can, convert the rest to Catholicism, take the gridded city, which was kind of a new thing um, for a lot of them, and they convert it. The, the heavy lines is the original Aztec city of Mexico. <coughs> And they establish a new grid, and they do what we do. We tear down the monuments of the pre-existing civilization. We rearrange the stones to create a, a Catholic church, and we reincorporate the palace. And so we don't just tear down what was there before. We displace what was there before. Sounds like redlining. So this was a severe redlining. The temple complex of the Aztecs became the capital of Mexico. So here's an extreme. The temple complex was so large in this case that it was too large to build a church out of the temple. So they bury the temple under a mountain. They just move a lot of dirt because they had slaves. Uh, and they create a mountain upon which to build the Spanish Catholic Cathedral. And the laws of the Indies, in some versions of this course, uh, I would have started by saying, the Americas were, the cities of the Americas were established by the Spanish using the laws of the Indies, which were based on Vitruvian laws from Rome. And uh, here is the proper mode of laying out a good city. This is a source of good city form. Start with a square and then extend the grid out from that square and tame the landscape and make it habitable for the people, right? But we are decolonizing the pedagogy in the 21st century and instead of just taking, uh, instead of behaving as if this is simply a matter of professional technical expertise, it is, uh, it's not, it's not that it's not professional technical expertise, it is. Sun angles, wind direction, the golden section, all of these design factors were very much part of establishing the laws of the Indies. And as good architecture students and professionals, it's important that you go into your careers knowing that there are technical reasons for laying out cities in a certain way, but we're not going to pretend that there wasn't another layer of forces operating. This system of the grid was a mechanism of imposing a feudal hierarchy on the landscape. Queen Isabel was fervently opposed to overt slavery. She said, these people, either, you either killed them or 
you convert them to Christianity. Those are the only two options. So if they're Christians, then they're not available to be slaves. They have souls. So no, no slaves. So instead of enslaving the local population, they indenture them through feudal mechanisms that together is the encomienda system. Uh, and the encomienda system is a system of um, you grow things and you owe a certain percentage of the product of that land investment to the feudal lord. And, um, but those feudal lords have a way of getting away with exploiting their Christian subjects uh, to the point of reproducing the conditions of slavery. So the encomienda system, while technically not uh, crossing that line into overt slavery, for all intents and purposes, slavery. And the key mechanism for having a handful of Spaniards controlling a vast population of uh, Americans, uh, it's a tough thing. So how do you do it? Who are you going to call? Who's, who can help? Uh, it's just a few of us. How are we going to control this vast population of slaves? We're going to call the architects and see if we can impose a system. Quick question. Yeah. Um, so isn't this basically the same thing that's happening nowadays? Like when, you, when you mentioned the income in the system, to me it was kind of like, oh, we all work in cities that are usually designed around this grid system. And we all have to pay taxes. And there's like a certain percent of the population that basically controls everything. Like what else is going on? So is that an idea, like something we adapt, like got from um, colonialism? That is a good question. Thank you. What do you guys think? Maybe we can talk about it on Wednesday. But the purpose of this example is to demonstrate what it looks like when the culture requires us to impose uh, a control system on a large uh, set of resources. Land resources, labor resources, <coughs> capital resources, the equipment of production, uh, in the pursuit of profits. The main thing that's going on here is extraction of raw materials. So this is a specific kind of capitalism. Uh, they're not adding value. It's not about, it's not like cotton, where you extract the cotton <clears throat> and then you weave it in mills and you sell it, and the factory system will get to that. But we're breaking it down. These four mechanisms, these four elements, these four factors of capitalism start with land. And the purest form of land capitalism, land-based capitalism, is the extraction of raw materials for profit. And it's really that simple. You pull, you pull the silver out of the mountain in Potosi, Bolivia, and you put it on ships, and you send those ships across the ocean, defend those ships against England and Dutch uh, armed ships that are trying to take the, the silver away from the Spaniards. And so you get that silver out of the mountain, send it to Europe, and flood Europe and China uh, and Japan with silver and cause a huge inflationary pressure that threatens to collapse the economies of Europe. But in the recovery, Spain has so much silver. They are the dominant forces Spain and Portugal, because of this extractive operation made possible by the architecture of these cities, uh, it works brilliantly. Does that make sense? Seville becomes a huge, successful city. In a, norm, in a conventional 20th century version of this course, 
we would look at the cities of Europe in this period and we say, look at Seville. They use this grid and, and this is the logic of technical planning and urban design that produces the city of Seville. It suffers an earthquake and is rebuilt very quickly because of the vast fortune coming across the Indian Ocean <coughs> and spices. Um, and, uh, and Seville is rebuilt, is not, let's see, I'm getting my, Lisbon is destroyed. Lisbon and Seville are both destroyed and rebuilt uh, based on the vast capital. So in order to understand the cities of Europe, it's useful to understand the role that those cities are playing in this large global uh, machine of extraction. So the Spaniards and the Portugal from 1600, or from 1500, from Columbus 1492, but from 1500 to 1600, extractive capitalism is the dominant force. Portugal and Spain are extracting wealth from spices and silver and pulling it in and building the cities according to that. And the silver and the spices are the basis of European uh, economic development for the, six, the entirety of the 16th century. And it's nice and tidy because the dates are more or less 1492, let's, we're friends here, let's call it 1500, just for the sake, to make it easier. And then around 1600, things shift abruptly. Slavery. Race. One of the systems that worked so effectively well in the Spanish Americas, was, and it was cataloged in, the, in paintings like this, is you grant authority and power and wealth to people who with Spanish blood, and you deny authority, power, and wealth to those uh, who have American blood. And then in between, remember uh, in our, in our top other topics, we talk about the 1% and the 80%. And the 1%, the control that the 1% exudes on the world is crucially um, supported by um, uh, the 19%. That if it weren't for the 19%, the 1% would not have no hope in controlling the wealth of the world. So the 19%, basically the architects are all in the 19% and everybody else. Uh, this is a chart that tracks the blood, the, the purity, the racial purity of the 19%. That everybody's competing to document their ancestry to trace themselves back to Spaniards and denying the ancestry that traces them back to Americans. And then my hand should go down, because that's the hierarchy. Spaniards at the top, Americans at the bottom, and the 19 percenters are competing for their rank position uh, between Spanish pure blood and American slave blood. And so uh, if you have the money, you can hire someone to forge your letter that documents your blood uh, purity. And these paintings were uh, careful control of skin tone in order to establish a catalog of the rank order of society. And this, we're gonna see more of this. So, you know, the connection, as <coughs> David, as you point out, the connections between this history and present day is not coincidental. Uh, we're very sensitive to uh, these things in history because it resonates with us today. And so we take special attention and look at it. So in 1600, very quickly, what happens is uh, the establishment of a new kind of capitalism. So from extractive capitalism, we move to our corporate um, financial speculative capitalism that is made possible by the rise of the modern corporation. So the Dutch and the English both establish 
the first joint stock companies in history. Um, we're going to look first at the Dutch uh, East India Company. Uh, and this is also something we had last summer, that um, once the spies were able to find the map that brings them to the Spice Islands, um, they sent Dutch ships uh, to bring back those spices. And the first ship uh, uh, was catastrophic. They covered the costs. Only, they, they sent out four ships at great expense. And it was a disaster. They lost three ships. People, uh, almost everyone died. A handful of sailors made it back on one ship. And with them, they had a pot of peppercorns that was a gift from the king on the north coast of Bali given to the Dutch captain as kind of a, like, this is pathetic. Why don't you take this and get out of here? And he showed up um, with his crew, most of his crew dead or missing, and everyone else you know, just floundering, the sails flapping in the breeze, and they were rescued uh, close to Amsterdam. And because they had a pot of peppercorns, they recouped from one pot of peppercorns, they broke even on the expedition. <clears throat> so the way they were doing things is if you wanted to send a ship to the Spice Islands, you would form a company, collect money, uh, uh, promising great profits, and then you invest, you build the ships, you send them out, and you hope for the best. Um, they did it again the next year. They sent out four ships, and they came back filled uh, with spices, and they made a 400% profit on their investment. <clears throat> but this was not a good way to do things. So they they invented this joint stock company, and they sent out. They said, "Listen, we're going to send out ships for the next 10 or 20 years. You buy a share in our company. We'll take your money. We'll invest it in 10 and 20 years worth of ships, and some will sink, losing all." And some will come back with huge profits. And it'll even out the risk. So the invention of the stock, company stock, was a way to uh, even out the risks. The insurance industry operates on the same principle. And by doing that, they created the ability to mobilize vast fortunes uh, in the pursuit of these endeavors to go off and grab spices and bring them back. And this fishing village uh, where the River I meets um, the North Sea became an important place to trade fish. And there's the fish market and the dike at the center of Amsterdam. Who's going to Berlin next? And so you guys will go to Berlin, and then you'll go to Amsterdam. Check this out. This is the Dom Rock. You'll see, you'll be walking on this place um, a year from now, or less than a year from now, right? So here's the fish market, and the practice of the fish market um, there's the joint stock, there's the wealthy stockholder, but markets uh, worked. The paper worked because of trust, and trust worked because of the architecture of the exchange. And when you hear about open markets, it's because uh, of the architecture of the Dutch exchange, the Amsterdam Exchange Building, where when I say I have fish um, uh, and I invite you to come look at the fish, the fish are right here. Uh, in the first market, here's still the original fish market. You say, I have some fish. You want to come see it? It's right here in the boat. And you say, oh. I don't need to see it. I trust you. No, no, really, come look at the, my fish. It's right here. Because the fish are right here, the guy buying the fish can afford to trust that the fish are good and in the proper quantities. So this, the, uh, the spatial arrangement between the market and the commodity here allows for trust. This is exchanging everything else other than fish. 
and because um, of the people gathered in that marketplace trusting each other, you establish uh, a culture of trust which allows paper to stand in for commodities, which is the basis of money. So what we're witnessing here is the role of architecture in the invention of money. The only reason money is possible is because the mechanisms of trust that are uh, manifest in the physical arrangement of this architecture and this urban form, fish market, stock market, the warehouse, the Wache, which is where the Bureau of Weights and Measures, when the guy weighs out um, 10 kilograms of flour, uh, the guy says, how do I know your scale's right? Oh, the, the, weight, the, the commissioner of weights and measures is right over here. I'll call him over. I blow my whistle, he'll come over and he'll recalibrate my scale. But because the building, the architecture is right there, the, the guy buying the flowers says, ah, don't bother, I trust you. There's no way that the commissioner of weights and measures would tolerate a miscalibration of the scales so this arrangement is the basis of trust. When I get a certificate uh, in exchange for the lumber that I took delivery on in Colombo, Sri Lanka, uh, I can take that paper without moving the lumber uh, from Amsterdam to Sri Lanka. I can say, here's a piece of paper. You can pick up the lumber in Sri Lanka where it is right now. And so he takes the piece of paper, takes it to Sri Lanka, and is able to collect the lumber in Sri Lanka without moving the lumber itself. It was produced on the Swahili coast of Africa and collected in uh, the port in Sri Lanka. I can take the certificate and walk over here to the town hall, the Stadthaus. In the town hall, there's the merchant's bank. I can present my certificate, and he'll give me money. Uh, the person in the bank. And the bank is in the town hall. So the integrity of the bank is the integrity of the political system of the government. So this is a machine of trust. This city is a machine for establishing trust, which makes it possible to use paper as a symbol of wealth. When you pull out a dollar bill, I don't know if you've ever seen a dollar bill, you guys use money? We used to call that money. And it used to say on it, in God we trust. Not so much God. It's kind of, oh, there's one. Right. So it's not so much in God we trust. It's more a culture of trust that is logically embedded in the system of exchange because it has a long history of working. And based on this, they had to build, so this is on one side of this exchange network uh, are the Dutch houses that you'll see when you go to the Amsterdam. Uh, there's a canal here and a street here and the nutmeg, mace, cloves, pepper come in on the canal and the vast majority of the section of the house is a warehouse. I, fill this to the rafters with cloves and nutmeg and mace. And when, uh, and I live in these humble little rooms here and I sell things uh, from the storefront here. Uh, and the, the uh, stairways are very narrow, so I hoist things up uh, from the hoistway that is at the end of every uh, Dutch gable. You see all these hoistways. Anyway, you'll see them. Um, because the Dutch house, 80% of the Dutch house is a warehouse. And at, back at the exchange market, when the price of pepper goes up, we quickly unload our, our loads of pepper and, and take it off, or we run off to the exchange market. We don't even bother to unload it. We say, I've got pepper to sell. And you do it all by paper, and then you can unload the commodity and send it either by horse-drawn carriage or by boat because it's a canal city. 
And so that's what's happening in the architecture of the house on the Amsterdam side of the system. Back in Southeast Asia, back in Java, the city of Batavia that the Dutch established, this is the equivalent. It's a storefront where the family lives here, and the rest is warehouse and factory where things are produced and processed and stored. And so on either side of this trade network, there are cities. Amsterdam is produced by this logic of canals so that you can quickly move your mace, pepper, and nutmeg from your house to the marketplace. And that's what it looks like. And the exchange. And the location in the market is specific to the commodity that's being sold. So we actually know what these people are selling because we can find that column in the map and we can see that um, they're selling whatever it says. And so Amsterdam became the capital of exchange in Europe because nowhere else in Europe were there so many people um, selling lumber. And so every person selling lumber, there were more people offering lumber at a specific price here than in any other city in Europe. And thus, there were more people buying lumber, you know, bidding, I'll buy, I'll buy a certain amount of lumber. There were more people selling and more people buying here than in any other city in Europe. Thus, the price established by the largest collection of of suppliers and the largest collection of demanders, supply and demand, uh, the price for lumber in all of Europe was established at this column in the open market uh, of Amsterdam. And sheets of paper were printed with the going rate of lumber, of uh, wool, of cotton, of fish, of everything. Every commodity you can name, uh, the price uh, was established in the open market of Amsterdam. And those price sheets were printed and distributed throughout Europe and the world. And this is where the price for these things were established. So it's all about, it's only possible because of the architecture of trust. And there were rules about what people wear. Can't really see it so much here. But there were rules about what people wear and how they behave and who, who can be there. You see uh, Ottoman Turk. Uh, and so you see people, traders from all over the world in the Amsterdam exchange. And, you, and the paintings, part of the role of the paintings was to uh, document this system of trust. Here's the merchant's bank in the new town hall. Here's the, the Bureau of Weights and Measures. Here's the fish market in the Amsterdam Exchange. It's just off the, the, off the screen. And the ships coming in from uh, Southeast Asia are, are right there. And in the foreground, because of the what people are wearing, um, and how they're moving about, you can tell who, this is a catalog of the international exchange. Each of these characters has a point of origin and a commodity that they're selling, and it's a catalog of global trade, right there in the painting. The same painters were sent off to Southeast Asia, And uh, the same uh, engineers were laying out the city of Batavia as were laying out the city of Amsterdam. Amsterdam had this concentric form because of its it historically preceded. But this was the model. This is the ideal canal city. Uh, Amsterdam already had its pattern, so they took this urban form and they wrapped it around the core of Amsterdam. 
And uh, in 1662, Amsterdam was exploding. It kept having to expand it. At the same time, this is 1667, Batavia, which is the Dutch East India Company's headquarters in Southeast Asia, its fortress, its canal town, uh, using the same model, it built its canal city. <coughs> it gave this section of town for Europeans, uh, and they tried to make it as attractive as possible because it was hard to convince Dutch uh, men to come to Southeast Asia to live there and be part of the colonial system. And then all of the, uh, the labor force, the low cost labor force, uh, some of them were technically slaves, but not all of them, uh, lived on the south side. Actually, this is the west side of the main canal. And so this system, it's really one city, one urban one urban operation separated by a 20,000 kilometer trade route. The north town and the south town. There's the Dutch portrait and there's, uh, by some of the same painters, they would paint the same scenes in Amsterdam and Batavia. Here's the fortress. Here's the governor general coming out uh, to inspect uh, the operations. The gallows, the prison the marketplace, and every character. Again, it's a catalog of all the people engaged in global trade on the other side. Some of the same ships that you see in that painting, you see here in Jakarta's uh, Batavia's Harbor. So it's two sides of the same coin. And it's also a directory. These maps were also directories of who who lived where. So this is a directory of the Dutch neighborhood, who lives where. And the wealthy Chinese are included in that. And then here you have the different categories of labor. And it's very important if you're going to operate a colony to segregate the working class. And this, should, so you, this is deliberately resonant with what we said earlier in the lecture that uh, the key to a handful of Europeans controlling a vast number of local workers is to divide them up into distinct groups so that they don't band together and fight against the colonial power. It's also uh, important that there be a 19%, which in this case are the wealthy Chinese merchants, who are given a certain degree of power and authority uh, who become, have a chance to get rich as long as they are part of the system that controls the vast labor force that continues the uh, system of working. And the way it, it worked out is you create gateways where you can control the movement of people. Uh, in South Africa, you had pass laws that uh, you couldn't go into certain neighborhoods without showing your passbook. But here, it's easier to force people to wear their identity in their costume. And so you, uh, under punishment of death, you have to wear certain clothing depending on what category you fit. And you are forced into a certain category. And you are forced to live in certain neighborhoods. And this continues up into the 19th and 20th century in Batavia, where the maps show the houses of the Europeans. Uh, this is around uh, 1920. Uh, the houses of the Europeans uh, with these vast gardens, right? these parks <coughs> shown on the map, these green areas. But they aren't actually green areas. They're actually the vast majority of the population lives in what is shown on the maps as a green area. This neighborhood right here that is shown as a, as a forest on the map is actually the kampong, the informal settlement of the vast majority of the inhabitants of the city of Batavia. Here's the European city. Here's uh, the native city. And they are segregated by racial category that is in, in 
encoded in their costumes. And so this is the research I've uh, presented in Singapore last November. Um, and here's the South African version where uh, you wear your identity in your passbook, much less efficient than the um, Batavian apartheid system. So moving quickly to the Industrial Revolution. So the, the key takeaway here is that this is the extraction of land resources. This is uh, financial speculation on the, the exchange value of those items. And now we're getting to the uh, speculation on the industrial production of those items. So, so far, there's a lot of raw things moving, but not a lot of uh, processing, not a lot of added value. There's no industrial revolution yet. When we get to the industrial revolution, these two things keep going. The extraction of raw materials keeps going. The speculation on uh, in the exchange, the, the ability to use paper and the architecture of trust to uh, have a lot of financial transactions over long distances. This ability to use paper quickly uh, surpassed what the Spanish and Portuguese uh, royal system was able to achieve. And so the, the Dutch and the English actually took over global colonialism from Spain and Portugal because they were able to uh, release and mobilize a much larger amount of money and a much larger system of domination. More ships, more factories, more cities, uh, more mines, more everything. And so the Dutch and the English took over around 1600. Then uh, from 1750 on, the, the English took over from the Dutch because they were able to produce uh, the factory system. <coughs> so water power, uh, which established all of the, the uh, so water power is actually a really clear urban form. And how many of you grew up in New England? So did you, how many of you grew up in New England and are aware of a mill town nearby? So um, near your homes, there is a mill town that is there because of what river? The Merrimack River? Mm -hmm. And um, what are the other rivers? Any other rivers? The Charles River? The Merrimack. The Merrimack. The Merrimack is the big one. Lowell, Lawrence, Nashua, Manchester, Concord. The list goes on and on. Am I missing any? And there's a new river in every single town. So right. And then there's the whole main system. So um, step one, dam the river at a high point and create a canal. Wherever there's a big change in elevation at the river, dam it up high and run a canal dead flat as far as you can uh, to where there's a cliff and the river below. And the dropping of that water, eight pounds a gallon, is that it? That's a lot, that's heavy. And by doing that, by dropping the water uh, at eight pounds a gallon, you can drive, a, you can generate a lot of torque, right? You took physics, and you can operate a lot of machines. And so build a factory at the top or the bottom of that cliff, and uh, you can take advantage of all that water force. The weight of that water dropping can drive your factories. But you have to build your factories right on the river. And so you get a lot of um, factory arrangements like this. Is that low? I can't remember. Um, and then comes coal. So coal comes along, and it's uh, a cheap fossil fuel. And you can actually get a lot more power than you can out of water. Uh, and so uh, coal replaces water power. Smoke fills the air. It becomes an extremely 
difficult place to live, and you have to concentrate the labor force within walking distance of the factories. So um, you get very, because there's no cars, uh, no cars yet, uh, it's too expensive uh, to take other means of transportation. You're starting to get railways, but passenger railways come much later than uh, commodity railways. And even when you have passenger railway service, it's not, uh, it's not useful for the labor force um, because it's too expensive and it takes too long and the schedules are difficult. So you end up with extremely congested industrial cities with a lot of coal smoke, and a lot of water pollution. Frederick Engels, uh, 1844. Um, Frederick Engels, in the editor's introduction to that reading, he points out that in 1844 there was a, such a thing as photography, but uh, they, didn't, they didn't illustrate uh, that it's just descriptive language. But soon after the publication, um, people started making maps. So the red is wealth, and the darker it gets, uh, the greater the poverty. And so you get a physical uh, documentation of the conditions that Frederick Engels uh, is describing in the booth maps of London, where you have uh, the great roads that pass through London lined with shiny shops, brightly lit uh, uh, in the evenings uh, with gas light. And behind those facades are these very dense courtyard worker housing that you read about. And you get illustrators uh, like Gustave Doré publishing scenes like this. Um, they are complemented by the maps and uh, the writing of people like Engels. So you get the reform movements to try to uh, find a way to get hygienic towns, and we did this in that class. Um, and you get, and that brings us to the Garden City movement. So I want to come back to uh, last week's reading. What's interesting to me is that um, the diagrams of the Garden City uh, were found to be so useful. Um, but what's the problem with the diagrams of the Garden City that Ebenezer Howard is offering? And here's a hint. It has to do with the same reason why you are not uh, encouraged, you're not allowed to bring diagrams in on Wednesdays. Why are diagrams inadmissible evidence in our work on Wednesdays? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the lessons of history are very specific and they're grounded in the actual reality of the historical record. Diagrams are what I'm, you know, you guys are so good at diagramming because what does your studio professor say? What do we say in studio week after week? Where's your diagram? You need a better diagram. Show me a good diagram. The danger, but well, what is the danger of the diagram? Yeah, it's not architecture. It's pre-architecture. It's useful to have next, as you draw the architectural drawings, it's really handy to have the diagram right there next to it, um, helping you get the architecture right. The diagram is there to keep us on track. What are we trying to do? What are we trying to do? What are we trying to do? And the architecture attempts as best it can to approach the power of the diagram. The architecture tries to do what the diagram does. And we fail, and then we try again, and we fail again, and we try again, and we fail again, right? You know how it is. But hopefully, on a good day, 
today's failure is slightly smaller than yesterday's failure. And if you do it enough, your failures get really small. And the diagram and the architectural uh, drawing start to approach each other in terms of impact and power. So that's the ideal. So di are diagrams important? Absolutely, they're crucial. But they're not, for the same reason they are so useful to push us to achieve more and more of their architecture, it makes them actually dangerous when it comes to learning the lessons of history. So as attractive as the Garden City diagram is, uh, it's just a diagram. And just to circle back to make sure it's clear, why was last week's topic called the Radiant Garden City Beautiful? Yes? Because um, at that point, it was a conglomerate of the multiple iterations of like city layout. Yeah. And who coined the term Radiant Garden City Beautiful? It wasn't it? Who coined that term? And here's a hint. It's in the reading. Mm. Who coined the term? Um, her name begins with G. Jane Jacobs. Jane Jacobs, thank you. So Jane Jacobs was the most important and fiercest critic of cities in the 20th century. Uh, someone asked me, what should I write my next book about? Um, and he said, I'm thinking about writing a book about Jane Jacobs. And I hate to think about this, but I said, oh God, don't do that. There's so much written about Jane Jacobs. They're like, okay, enough already. Jane Jacobs this, Jane Jacobs that. Then she died, and now we can't get enough books about Jane Jacobs. And even he wrote a book about Jane Jacobs. Um, this is the guy who had one of his books made into a movie uh, about that Indian mathematician. Anyway, I'm so embarrassed that I discouraged him from writing about Jane Jacobs. She is so important in part because she said all, and again, she's not trained as an architect or a planner, she said, all of you design professionals, you're so intoxicated by your own abstractions. You, uh, you come up with this idea of the city beautiful, with these boulevards, and it's a giant diagram that you impose on the city and you say, oh, isn't this wonderful, and you pat yourselves on the back. Then you come up with this other diagram, the Garden City. You impose it on the unsuspecting people, uh, and you say, isn't this beautiful? And you pat yourselves on the back. And then Corbusier comes along and gives us the Radiant City and imposes it on the people with all this functional uh, zoning uh, segregation of different uses and race. And you pat yourselves on the back and say, oh, these are all just different versions of the same pig-headed blind uh, diagrams, abstraction. It's really just one big diagram. I'm going to call it the Radiant Garden City Beautiful. The term Radiant Garden City Beautiful is a diss. It is a critique of the sum total of two centuries of design and planning of cities. And she says, you guys have destroyed the world. You guys are destroying the cities of North America. You're destroying my city, New York City. Uh, you want to cut highways through Central Park. You want to cut a highway down 42nd Street. You want to cut a highway through Washington Square Park. You want to go to Boston and cut a highway through Roxbury. All of these highways cutting through cities were stopped by the movement triggered by Jane Jacobs' critique of the radiant garden city beautiful abstractions that design professionals have been foisting on an unsuspecting public for two centuries. So she was the revolutionary who uh, made it, who changed the landscape for everything we will do, everything you will do in your careers. 
um, and it's better, better block, it's tactical urbanism, it's Yangil, it's visible, um, it's vision zero, it's livable cities. All of these movements that uh, if you haven't seen them coming at you on the WhatsApp channel yet, strap in because here it comes. It all comes out of these abstract diagrams that are designed to fix the problems produced by the industrial city. So everything in your careers, so I'm trying to make good on what you guys asked in the last few seconds, your career of work grows out of the critique that Jane Jacobs said, it's not about these diagrams, it's about the life of the street. C cities and architecture succeed or fail depending on the degree to which people can walk down the street and feel safe and happy and reinforced. We get our impression of the world itself through our experience of walking through public space or taking public transportation. And that's the, the driver <coughs> behind all of these movements that are coming at you from WhatsApp. And this is a correction of the Radiant City Beautiful uh, diagramming of designers for centuries attempting to overcome and repair the damage of uh, naked capitalism exploiting people uh, and in the process imposing great harm. So here's the optimistic part. Even the informal settlements of the developing world do not look like this. This is way worse. What Engels is writing about is way worse than the conditions we find throughout the world in what we call the informal settlements. So all of this negativity about capitalism should not uh, dissuade you from understanding that while uh, the wealthiest have gotten extremely wealthy, uh, vastly disproportionate to anything ever before seen in human history, the poorest people in the world have benefited as well, but just at the cost of income disparities that are off the ch literally off the chart. Remember that? So uh, that's the context. This is the large uh, five century framework. 500 years of history, this is the context for your careers. It comes at the end of this 500 years of history. You will be more effective and happier if you understand these forces and can operate in the context of understanding these forces. You will understand, you are candidates for understanding these forces better than anyone you ever work with. Think about that. That's power, okay? So thank you and uh, stick around if you have questions. Thank you.